Welcome to HDB Agronomy Week 2020. The live stream session will start shortly. Before we begin, we wanted to remind you of a few points of housekeeping. You're all on mute, so don't worry, we can't hear you. The session is scheduled to last between one and one and a half hours, including questions. We want this session to be as interactive as possible, so please post your questions throughout the session using the live Q&A function in the Agronomy Week platform below. We're recording this session, so if you miss anything or would like to watch it again, it will be available on the HDB YouTube channel and HDB website. You can also come back and watch the recordings on the Agronomy Week platform for three months. At the end of the session, we'll provide you with unique basis and Neuroso codes. Don't forget to complete the basis and Neuroso forms using the relevant tabs on the platform. You have two weeks after the live session to register for your points. Join in the conversation online. Follow AHDB underscore cereals and AHDB underscore potatoes on Twitter and use the hashtag Agronomy Week. If you have any issues with the conference platform, there are digital event FAQs in the menu on the left hand side. You can use the help tab to contact the team if you experience any technical problems during the week. We hope that you enjoy Agronomy Week 2020. Thanks for joining us. Your session will now start. So welcome and good morning to everyone. Um, I hope you're all enjoying Agronomy Week so far. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, I'm Alex Wade. I'm the Knowledge Exchange Manager for HDB Potatoes, covering the uh, West Midlands, South Western Wales, and I'll be uh, chairing this session today. This morning's session uh, is going to be on preventing, detecting and controlling nematodes. Now, as we know uh, and understand, nematodes uh, are hugely important within the potato sector as they can cause significant problems such as decreased yield, uh, quality and much more, which the um, speakers will go into more detail about. Now, the first session is targeted to finish at 12.30 with a few questions throughout, uh, if required, and a panel session at the end with all of our speakers. So um, I'll just go through the run through of today. So first up at 11.10, we have uh, Dr. Roy Nielsen from the James Hutton Institute. Um, so just a bit of background, um, at a project meeting about the BBSRC blackleg project, um, Roy offered to talk about the connection between nematodes and blackleg at a suitable event. Uh, we quickly took him up on, up on that offer for um, agronomy week. Now, many agronomists um, and others in the industry realise that nematodes are hugely important and are aware of the lack of knowledge in, in, in the subject. Um, now, Roy will highlight results of preliminary experiments that suggest a link between root damage to potatoes from plant parasitic nematodes and infection by blackleg. Now, these results have formed the basis of a multiple partner research project, which he will outline. Move, moving on from this, uh, we, we, we have uh, Grace Choto from AHDB working on the Best for Soils. Uh, at around 11.30. Now, Grace is the AHDB rep on base, Best for Soils, which is a European uh, Union Horizon 2020 project, which combines the work of many nematologists. Uh, the database they have created will be a valuable uh, reference for which crops um, are damaged, how much, um, by what nematodes, and also which are non-hosts. Uh, that can be used in rotations to control the numbers of other nematodes. Um, as with Roy Nielsen's topic, this is one which agronomists have been asking for, and Grace will start with the nuts and bolts of the database, how to use it in worked examples, um, and then she'll go on to describe the strength of the evidence behind it and the project as a whole. And then last but certainly not least, uh, at around 11.55, is Craig Chisholm from the Nematicide Stewardship Programme. Um, so at a nematicide stewardship program meeting, uh, we mentioned again the chance for the NSP to take part uh, in webinars and Craig, Craig showed interest, which was great. So, um, you know, despite the, the big drive towards IPM, granular nematicides are highly uh, valued by growers for control of PCN, um, especially. Now, many growers are, you know, open and honest that PCN is their biggest problem and they rely on Viadate and Nemethorin 
um, to, to control it. Now, these products are used against various parasitic nematodes, but, but chiefly PCN. Um, and they, they are toxic chemicals, uh, but good stewardship has made a major contribution um, to their continual approval. And, and, and I think Craig will touch on that. And um, such stewardship relies on all concerned, really understanding what must be done and how to do it. And uh, Craig, Craig is the man to explain this. So uh, the NSP has been the main driver for improved safety in the use of, of nematicides, um, which is vital part of retaining approvals for the products. And Craig will explain what growers and agronomists uh, can do and need to do as part of stewardship and um, what helps what help uh, the NSP can offer. I'd also like to add that there are a few polls for this session um, that can be found beneath the live feed. Now, I think if they all work properly, they should open automatically. However, if not, uh, you know, once prompted, just scroll down, um, right click and open in a new tab um, for to complete the polls. And then this will ensure that the session uh, keeps playing the whole time. Um, so, and then finally from me, just to set the scene a little bit and, and, and wake everyone up, um, obviously there are a lot of nematodes which can cause a problem in a potato crop. Now, the main ones being talked about today are going to be um, root lesion nematodes, so Pratilenchus, which are associated with other pests and diseases, um, as Roy will discuss. But uh, I also encourage you all to listen to the PhD showcase, Valeria Orlando from uh, Harper Adams University, at 4 p.m. today, uh, which is specifically on Pratilenchus, where she will dive into a lot more detail. Secondly is, is the stubby root nematode, which are the vectors of TRV causing sprang, uh, specifically the paratrichodorids and the trichodorids. And finally, uh, PCN, mainly pallida, but uh, Rostoskiensis as well, which I'm sure we all know and love. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass on to Roy to kick off this session. Thank you very much, Alex, and thank you very much for the EHDB um, for the invitation to speak um, at Agronomy Week. And good morning, uh, everyone on the line. And anyone who's just um, tipped up a few seconds wait are going to be a bit confused seeing a title, a decision support tool for potato black leg disease in a nematology session. But hopefully by the end of this uh, presentation, um, it will become apparent why uh, this presentation is in, in an nematode session. Next slide, please. So I think it's maybe worthwhile to take a little step back um, for a couple of slides to give a general view on nematodes. And this is some eye-watering data that um, a number of us published uh, in a couple of papers over the last year. This was a global study um, with the global sort of nematology community where we pooled resources and looked at multiple thousands of samples um, across the world and we wanted to do this for two reasons one to highlight the importance of nemato nematodes in soils per se but also indicate sort of how they're impacted by climate change and the biodiversity crisis so we have a um, a global map where actually maybe counterintuitively the darker colors are the lower abundance and the lighter colours are the highest abundance. But in short, for every basically one human on Earth, there are 57 billion nematodes. Just have a think about that. And in terms of biomass, the total nematode biomass is approximately 80% of the global human biomass. And thinking of um, a climate change impacts, um, the amount of carbon respired by cell nematodes is equivalent to 15% of the carbon emissions from fossil fuel use across the world. So nematodes are hugely important in soils, not only obviously just in crops. And the bottom panel that I've highlighted there is the different functional groups. And the one I've highlighted is the ones that most of the audience will be uh, um, interested in, the plant parasitic or the herbivores. But the other groups are actually beneficial um, nematodes, especially the bacterial feeders. Next slide, please. And this is an excellent infographic taken from a paper published a few years ago in scientific reports, but really encapsulates the role of nematodes in soil. 
from the plant parasitic ones that we're, most of the audience here will be interested in, the herbivores, how they feed on the roots, create wiki roots, and then in addition to the exudates that the roots um, pump out into the soil, which feed the bacteria and then the fungi, and then the beneficial nematodes feed on the, both bacteria and the fungi, to then mineralize organic matter, nutrients, and provide nutrients to plants. So not only is there a, a negative role of nematodes, there's a hugely beneficial role of nematodes. Next slide, please. And that's actually the first question, the first poll question. Were you aware there are actually more beneficial nematodes in soil than pathogenic nematodes? I mean, most of us are aware, and I, when I certainly started in nematology, the pathogenic nematodes was the focus. But were you aware that there's actually many, many more beneficial nematodes than pathogenic? Next slide, please. But let's get back to really what I think most of the audience will be interested in. Um, pathogenic nematodes. As Alec mentioned, I'm just briefly mentioning Pratoenchus valeria. We'll talk in, in great detail later um, uh, of our uh, studies and our, our results from our PhD. But one of the reasons I wanted to highlight Pratoenchus here is uh, a number of the nematodes that you'd be aware of obviously do direct damage uh, to roots, resulting in reduced yield, stunted crops, all the symptoms that we're very familiar with. But Pratoenchus, for example, has been implicated in a number of disease complexes. For example, there's been studies um, conducted by a Norwegian nematologist which has implicated Pratoenchus associated with common scab. And there's a um, significant amount of work in North America which is implicated, and actually not implicated, shown that Pratoenchus is a key driver of potato early dying disease, where Pratoenchus um, feeds on the roots and also the st just the, the stem below ground, creates a wound site, and Verticillium dalii enters the uh, plant, and that's a causal agent of potato early dying disease. But if it wasn't for the nematode, the Pratoenchus feeding, then the fungus could not enter the plant. Next slide, please. And this is where the story starts in, our, in this instance about potato blackleg. I don't think I have to really um, go through the importance of blackleg to the industry. Obviously, it's one of the most economically damaging bacterial plant pathogens in the UK. It's got significant impact on quality throughout the supply chain um, and it's huge economic impact. Next slide, please. It's well known that there's multiple routes of infection for blackleg in the potato crop. Next slide, please. And we know that blackleg is linked to the level of contamination in seed tubers. Next slide, please. Furthermore, we know that uh, irrigation is a driving factor, especially in field generation one. Uh, next slide, please. And for a whole variety of reasons, we are aware that there are a number of them um, IPM interventions for blackleg. But notwithstanding all that background knowledge, there was still a potential missing factor. Something was still possibly or potentially driving blackleg incidence and disease in the potato crop. Next slide, please. Could it be nematodes? Could it be potentially nematodes acting um, as a driving a disease complex as we're aware that Pratoenchus, for example, does for other diseases. And this um, story really started to take shape when a number of um, key actors in the supply chain were anecdotally telling us, we, we've got high incidence of bagley, but we've also got high abundance of um, free living nematodes or plant, path plant pathogenic nematodes. Could there be a link? And over the years, this feedback has reached a crescendo. And I mean, it, nematodes exist in all soils. 
the current mixed populations, what I mean by mixed populations, we have multiple pathogenic species in soils, in fields. So it's not just a single species. So there's lots of potential candidates implic potentially implicated in such a story. And as I say, we, we're, we're familiar with the various um, symptoms of a whole range of disease. Next slide, please. So this is some preliminary data funded by the Scottish Society of Crop Research. Um, work done with Sonia Humphreys, Warren Watt and uh, Emma Campbell at the James Hutton Institute, where we ran a series of um, laboratory-based um, experiments to explore whether the addition of nematodes would in fact increase the incidence of black leg on potatoes. And this is um, some summary data. So we've got four sets of data. The black is um, black, uh, black leg um, in the roots only, red stem only, and then the blue is black leg plus the addition of nematodes to, to the experiment. And the incident and the, and the purple is the incidence of black leg and with the addition of nematodes in the system, but measured in the stem. So logarithmic scale on the y-axis, and in short, the increase in black leg incidence with the, on roots with the addition of nematodes was a tenfold increase. The addition of nematodes into the system with the incidence of black leg on the stems was a hundredfold increase. And this experiment's been repl replicated a number of occasions. So this is actually the first indication through preliminary experimentation that nematodes may indeed be a factor within the black leg um, disease uh, system. Now, the question is, which nematodes? And then this is where we come on to the current project. So these particular experiments, these were the whole nematode community. I'm a great believer that we should have the whole nematode community in pot experiments. And the reason I, I'm a believer in this is then we're getting the interactions, the real life interactions of the nematode, nematode community. We're not having an artificial situation where we're picking out a particular species that then may behave in a different way to a field situation. And the image on the right side, hand side, produced by a colleague, Kath Wright at the Hutton, is actually further showing um, uh, black leg with um, some uh, fluorescence marker actually in the tissue of um, the stem. Next slide, please. These results resulted in um, a range of discussions with a whole range of partners. And you see these partners um, highlighted in the uh, slide here. And we came together and um, applied to BBSRC for funding um, to fully explore the potential um, of nematodes being a factor within the black leg story. We're thankfully, we were successful um, for that funding, which started three months ago in September. Next slide, please. And I'll just give a couple of minutes walkthrough of what the project aims to present uh, at the end of the three year period. So it, the um, work is separated into discrete but interlinking areas. And first off, we want to identify potential vectors. Well, it's called vectors, but facilitators is maybe a better word of black legs. So we're looking at not only nematodes, but we're also looking at aerial um, facilitators as well as insects. The thinking here of um, the nematodes, we'll actually, again, go back and replicate the experiments that um, I highlighted earlier. And then we'll start to focus down on candidate nematodes. For example, Pratolenchus, Trichodorus, Paratrichodorus, and of course, there are other candidates as well, but these in my head are the ones that will be the prime candidates. We will run a series of pot experiments and through unique real-time imaging facilities that we have at the Hutton, we're also going to be able to um, visualize feeding of the nematodes and also um, the interaction with black light in a real-time situation. 
In addition, we've got field work um, run by Mark Stalm with regard to irrigation, because irrigation, as we know, has an important component of a black leg story. And if you think about it, irrigation and moving the water table up and down actually brings the nematodes closer in contact to the potatoes through certain parts of the growing season. And we need to understand that interaction to see whether there's a, a simple intervention that could be to mitigate um, the black leg story. Furthermore, um, there is aspects of cover crops. Can we use cover crops to mitigate um, the black leg nematode story? And then we're going to work, done with some of the partners, look at the bacterial communities in the rhizosphere. Um, are there beneficial communities there that might help to mitigate um, um, black leg? Is there an impact to root, art root architecture? And is root exudate a driver of the system as well? And all, those, all that information then feeds into modeling work where we aim to um, construct a UK national risk mapping for black leg based on um, current information, current databases, including climate, um, variety trial and data, and our own information. Use machine learning techniques to develop uh, ultimately the decision support tool um, that we um, set out our aim to, to generate at, at the end of the project. And finally, there is a, a work package, an area of work to look at knowledge exchange and support the implement, implementation of the tool, understand um, how um, the target audience, such as a farm, as an agronomist, would like the um, decision support tool to be working in it effectively in their arena. And that actually outlines the project and the background for it. Next slide, please. So the final poll um, for this talk is, did you know that free living nematodes can be part of disease complexes? And most people will be familiar with the, um, the nematodes that Alex listed, such as PCN, um, Parachichodorus, Trichodorus, and Pratolenchus, and maybe more aware of the direct damage uh, to roots. But were you aware that free living nematodes can be part of a disease complex? Next slide, please. And just a very final note. Um, it's World Soil Day in two days' time. Uh, it's very pertinent to be talking about soils. So if we don't have healthy soils, we don't have healthy crops. And the very last slide is just an acknowledgement. Next slide, please. To Ian, Sonia, Cathorn, and Emma, um, without this work, um, ultimately this project couldn't come apart, it couldn't be realized. And I also want to thank the AHDB digital team who have been absolutely fantastic supporting certainly myself and I assume all the speakers to be able to present this to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roy. Um, a very interesting presentation on, on, you know, on that on that link between black leg and, and nematodes, and I think, you know, something that'll be interest to to all of us um, when when the further research projects um, come out. Um, we're gonna we're gonna jump to a little Q and A now, um, just for some of the burning questions, and then we'll have the poll answers afterwards. So, first first one for you, Roy. Um, what time frame in the potato season are we predicting the most infection to be in? And is there anything we can do to reduce it? Good question. I'll come back in three years' time and uh, hopefully answer that one. I mean, that's part of, that is part of the actual project um, sure. because we need, to, we need to actually go really start from, I don't want to say basics, but understand the full disease pipeline. And that's part of the project as well. Lovely stuff. Um, another question that's come in, is it wise to ignore PCN with disease interactions as appears to be the case at present? We know PCN can make PED worse. I have seen clear indications of PCN and bacteria infection. It's another, it is another candidate um, nematode and we would be unwise to ignore it. And then we'll, we'll, we'll have one more. Um, Dr. Nielsen said there was an anecdotal information that blackleg and FLN were associated. Anecdotally, 
which FLN were concerned? Yeah, anecdotally, the ones that have been um, suggested are Pratolinkus and Trichodorus and Paratrichodorus, but Pratolinkus is the one that keeps cropping up the most. But as the previous um, question notes, I mean, there are other candidates out there, such as PCN, um, and I can reel off another half a dozen um, as well. But um, yeah, Pratolinkus has usually been the one that's been identified, yeah. but we have yeah. to have an open mind. No, for sure. So, um, we'll, we'll, there's a few more questions come in, but I think we'll save them to the end. If we if we switch to the polls now, please, um, and we can have a look at the results of those. So, the first one, were you aware there are more beneficial nematodes in soil than pathogenic nematodes? And the answer is yes. Any any comments, Roy? Yeah, no, that's great, Ash. I mean, that's, that's a, a two-to-one, um, res, you know, ratio there but i suspect that maybe when i started nematology <clears throat> way too long ago um the answer would have been radically different and i think um this is a a, a reflection of the uh, increase in recent years of uh, soils research work and and the and the sort of a systems approach a more wider uh, appreciation of uh, the importance of soil and the soil organism so that's that's, that's fantastic and, and and it all sort of leads to a greater understanding of sustainable production yeah yeah and uh the, the next one did you know that fln can be part of disease complexes that's interesting uh, i mean it, that, that's, that's very encouraging to to uh, know that there's a, a a breadth of uh, knowledge out there that understands that it's just not direct damage through um, just feeding so that's that's fantastic okay perfect um so thank you for that roy um thank you we'll now pass over to grace um from ahdb uh, best for soils to discuss the the new database on on nematodes uh thank you alex uh good morning um my name is grace choto i work as an ahdb horticulture knowledge exchange manager um, today I'm speaking on an EU Best for Soils Nematodes database, which really is an aid to rotational planning. So uh, just, you know, you know this already, we've got our own brand of work, uh, of soils work under the banner of Great Soils. This EU Best for Soils uh, project is in addition to this. So this is separate but AHDB are helping with it. We are facilitating and just talking about project outcomes. Uh, and just to say as well, you know, uh, Great Soils on the Great Soils website, um, we have a collection of resources from across the sectors because uh, from our history, AHDB levy sectors came together and we're now working together. So although we are sharing branding, we'll still have some publications that might fall outside of Great Soils that will be useful. Um, so for example, you've got the Matthew Bax's uh, Biofumigation Guide, which if you wanted to find easily, because our, our website is also a work in progress, you could just go into AHD, uh, into uh, on Google and you could search Biofumigation AHDB and it will bring you to the publication. So we have quite a range of publications under Great Soils, as well as videos and uh, project reports. So on to the Best for Soils uh, project. Uh, this is an EU Horizon 2020 uh, thematic network project uh, with eight project partners across the EU. Uh, mostly they are applied researchers and advisors, uh, but also it's got 20 facilitators. So we are facilitators, we are invited stakeholders. And our role is really uh, ending on the 30th of September 2020. One, uh, the project aims to improve soil health across Europe through the promotion of four best practices and sound crop rotations. And again, it's got its own free resources, fact sheets and videos in the different EU languages. Um, so I think soils information is spread across different things and it's a matter of looking for what you are after. And some of these publications, including for our own website on Great Soils, some of them are very technically detailed, but we have to remember that if we are experts in soils or if you are experts, then there might be somebody within your industries that are not experts and some of these publications uh, will be useful for them if they are starting out on soils. 
So this is their main project page. Um, and essentially it says, we're trying to optimize crop rotation uh, through organic amendments um, and, and cover cropping and uh, biosolarization where it works and anaerobic soil disinfestation. So those are the four best practices where this number four comes from. Um, compost um, uh, and um, any any other additions uh, that you could put uh, to the soils, uh, then biosolarization for warmer climates, crop, uh, cover crops, catch crops, trap crops uh, uh, under that banner. And then you've got also anaerobic soil disinfestation. Uh, in addition, they've got this pathogens uh, database and the nematodes database. And I'm focusing on the nematodes database today, uh, which is to aid um, with rotational uh, planning. Again, like I said, it's got its own resources and videos. Uh, you need to go on the website and you can check what's applicable to you. So nematodes, unless you're Roy or, you know, you are Matthew Back or somebody else who's, who's got a lot of knowledge in this area, you'll probably be more like me. You do a bit of nematology at school. Uh, you use it here and there, but really your knowledge is limited. So there are a, a range of nematodes and this nematodes database was built by EU nematologists because uh, people are aware that there's not many nematologists around uh, even within Europe. So there's a group of nematologists that came together to, 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 to put this database into place. We know that nematodes are a problem. I work in horticulture and this is just an example. So we funded a project FV447 in horticulture on carrots and parsnips, developing a strategy to control free living nematodes. And the final report headlines were, well, a significant knowledge gap exists with regards to the impact of free living nematodes on carrot and parsnip production. A bit similar to what Roy was saying, really, you know, we don't know we are only understanding and getting to know some things through research, but we don't understand it all. But also, I think for horticulture, in terms of rotations, this is also compounded by the lack of land. So the second deadline was a lack of available land to increase rotational length and considerable use of rented land as significant constraints, constraints for deploying novel strategies to manage free living nematodes. So, you know, you've got the problem of, of trying to rent land, uh, you've got the problem of trying to increase rotation as well. And it's, it's hard really sometimes, but uh, that's, uh, that's what you should be doing. And the project came up with potential alternative management strategies uh, to manage these free living nematodes. And you can see all those things, they're applicable to potatoes as well, as well as all those crops that are affected by nematodes. So rotation is there and this database is to help with rotational planning, but you've got other things like biofumigation, which are using cover crops, which Royce projects will also uh, uh, kind of um, investigate. So you know, there, there are a lot of things and you know it's, it's like an armory which you have to try and use where your, your land, if you're really at risk, uh, you have to try and put in as many measures as is possible to reduce those numbers. So what does the database do? Well, it provides information on the host status and damage sensitivity of a crop or green manure for a large number of nematode species. So there's a lot of information on the crops, but not on green manures because, you know, green manures, the, the research is still ongoing um, and it's, it's kind of a new field really. So there's not as much information on green manures, but they are adding on to the information. So it can be used as a management tool to risk raise the potential of a nematode damage on a crop when se sequenced within a specific rotation. So where you are, for example, renting land, you could look at the rotation and say, okay, which crops are preceding my potato crops? And will this have an issue on my potatoes? Uh, and the risk rating is determined by soil type and on whether or not preceding crops maintain or support nematode buildup or decline. Obviously, there'll be a natural decline sometimes, but it takes long because some of these nematode cysts are, uh, are, uh, survive in the soil for very long periods of time. Uh, but then you have to be, you know, you have to interpret the results after you use the, uh, nem uh, the, the nematodes database for your own specific uh, situation. Uh, but we have to stress that obviously you need to find out what nematodes are in the field through soil sampling and testing. And there are rigorous standards for sampling for seed potatoes, but I don't know what happens for, for, for the other potatoes. 
uh, just normal potato crops. Uh, but essentially, you would need somebody to do a proper uh, sample analysis and again, you know, interpret those results for your own specific scenario. It can answer the questions, what are the crops in the rotation? Are they affected or do they support nematodes of concern? So where you know you've got specific problems, you could ask the database just to concentrate on that particular nematode. Or it could answer, could I order my crops differently on my own land to reduce nematode populations before my next uh, crop? Uh, again, could cover crops reduce populations where I have issues or would they increase numbers? Again, you know, you need to soil sample and you need to test. So there's uh, the screenshot of the data uh, mining and the database. And essentially, it's a huge spreadsheet that's sitting uh, uh, behind what you will see, what's presented on, on your screen. Uh, those crops, at the moment, it says 69 crops, but they are adding on to those crops. They looked at crops that were relevant to Europe, uh, as well as 52 nematodes. They've also got a pathogens database, which they are still building. The nematodes uh, database is essentially built, but it's improving as they add on new knowledge. Um, so the project uh, started off with a big work package on data mining, uh, where a group of researchers from Ireland, Switzerland, and Denmark did an extensive literature search um, from peer-reviewed reports, institute reports, books, conference papers, everything really they could find. And then later on, data from Spain and Italy were added. So this is really a global a mining of, of literature to come up with this uh, database. Um, and so what it does is it throws at you, once you've put in your sequence, and I'll show you how to do that, it will throw you a, a sequence of colors and dots um, where, you know, uh, where it shows you the level of damage on the crop and whether or not that crop supports uh, nematodes uh, buildup. Uh, the colors and dots were only added to the scheme where the combination of a crop and a nematode was substantiated by five or more literature references. So they have tried to, they are nematologists that build this database, so they've tried to use that knowledge accordingly. You have to use Chrome or Microsoft Edge. It doesn't work on the old Internet Explorer. So you have to choose your language. It's mandatory as well as soil types. And then you have to choose the crops you are growing or would like to grow. You can essentially order or sequence your crops. And then there's this create scheme button and then the scheme opens uh, in PDF. And I'll show you all this in a second. And so that's the main page, which we'll go to in a bit. You have to go down to the bottom here. If you can see the bottom of my screen, that's where you've got the database, uh, the databases. I did an example for you here. So I looked at potatoes. I'm not a potato. I work in horticulture uh, and I'm not a potato expert um, but by any uh, chance. So I don't know much about potatoes, essentially, just a, a few bits that I, that I learned. So I just went in and I went potatoes. So these uh, drop the crosses, you can drop the menus down. If you know the nematodes you're, you're dealing with, you can choose those nematodes. But this is mandatory. So I've entered United Kingdom, Sandy Soil and Potato Field X. And then uh, as I've just opened these other windows, so you can see, because I didn't know what nematodes are um, a problem for, uh, for potatoes, I essentially, in the next slides, I just chose all the nematodes to see where the literature supported that there were issues uh, for these nematodes on potatoes. And so that's my first scheme. Uh, you can see the one I ran, I chose all the nematodes. And on there, I don't know whether you can see clearly, but we've got where you've got your potato cyst nematodes, you've got the pink there. And the pink says it's this is serious damage for both the white um, and, and uh, the other, the G pallida and the other potato uh, nematode. Um, and then the three dots says you, these crops, potato is a very good host. So you essentially, if you have potato soon enough in the rotation, uh, in a land that has a problem, then obviously you'll be multiplying the, those nematodes. But then I moved on. You can see the root nut nematodes, Meladegyne, Chitwoody, and Phalax. They are also an issue. Uh, they affect a nematode similar to what the, the potato cyst nematodes do. You've got also Hapla there. Then you've got Pratilenchus penetrans, Ditilenchus dipsaki, and Paratikodorus. You know, I can't say these nematodes. 
But yeah, you, you do uh, understand, you, you, I've, all I've done is chosen all the nematodes and said, you know, which ones are the problem for potatoes. And the scheme uh, picked these ones. And so then I picked the all those nematodes that were chosen to be issues for potatoes. And I tried to se sequence them within a rotation. So I put like sugar beets there, then I put triticale, wheat, potato, in that order. So I don't know, maybe that's a spring wheat, perhaps before potatoes. And then obviously all these nematodes were an issue for potatoes. Potatoes is at the bottom. And then I'm looking at my previous crops before potatoes. I can see that where I've got shit woody, the bit there, you know, it's medium damage. It's a poor host. So maybe they won't multiply too much. But for phallax, then you know although it's immediate the crop itself beet is uh obviously a medium damage on the beet crop but it's really a good host so it will multiply those nematodes a species before your crop and the the key really is to have crops before your rotations that are not multiplying the nematode species of concern then i went fill vegetables just you know to see which ones maybe would be good you can see critical land wheat, they seem fine, except for cheat woody and phallax. They're at the bottom. Uh, sugar beet, we've already done that. But there are other things there. We've got maize. I don't know whether people ever put maize within um, a, 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 a rotation. Now, the ones at the top are still the nematodes of concern to potatoes. So I just chose other field crops. Um, uh, you know, which could be put in this in, in this rotation according to how they are labeled within the scheme. So you can see that barley is labeled as field crops. It's a work in progress, but it's nearly there. But you can see that, you know, you've got our potatoes there. Okay. Uh, then you've got, oh, sorry, these are the field crops. You've got your beet. You've got uh, maize. It can create issues. Rye. If you've got Ditilenkas dipsaki, maybe right before your potato is not a good thing. Uh, what you want is really green across. Then I put vegetables. Um, so for the vegetables, you can see that onion before your rotation could be a problem. Peas could be a problem because it's still those nematodes of interest to potatoes that are on there. So you can as well, and you can see where you've got question marks it means the data is not there. It's not sufficient for them to be putting the color coding and the dots. Uh, but as they are reviewing literature, the project is still, still going on, they will add to this. So it's really important to keep coming back to it to check if it's got new information. And also what they are trying to do is where you've got a combination that's pretty bad. If I go on pink with the three dots, if I then clicked on that, Behind, it would have information that's, again, uh, literature searches that might help with the management of that particular uh, crop uh, where you've got the problem nematode. Cover crops, like I said, they're still building it. They've got information on Italian ryegrass across all the nematodes. That's a good thing, as well as perennial ryegrass, radish, phacelia, whatever you use, it may be for biofumigation, you can check what these crops are doing to your uh, potato uh, nematode uh, buildups. And that's the project website, uh, which I will try and now go into. For you, hold on. I'll share my screen again. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Can you see that? Well, uh, I hope you can. Um, what we've got is we've got this is the main project page. If you click on database, there's the database. You scroll down, you go to where it says database nematodes because we've got a pathogens database. If I click on that, that's mandatory, so I can choose the UK there. Then I can put the soil type and I can put my potato field. And then I can select my crops. 
So you've got two scroll down menus here for the database and your normal one, which is outside. So you've got two, you've got to scroll both of them. So I can put wheat and then just potatoes, for example. If I know I've just got cis nematodes, my potato cis nematodes, which are the problem, uh, I can pick on them there. But, you know, if I've got freely living nematodes as well, that I think are a problem, then I can choose them as well. Great. And Sorry, then, just, to, just to stop you there. Um, we've lost that now, unfortunately. Um, oh, I don't know if you can stop sharing and bring it back. Um, if not, I'll give you a minute to do that. But if not, we'll um, we will we'll move on to questions. But it sounds quite self quite okay. quite easy. I'll, okay, thank. I'll share again. Can you see that? Yes, we've got it now. Yes, brilliant. Okay, so all I've done is I've dragged down the windows and I've yep. clicked the nematodes of interest and then you go create scheme. And there it is. I can try and blow it up. No, lost it again. I think when you when you click um, for the next window, it, 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 it's, it's losing it. Loses. All right. But so, essentially what it then does is it opens a page and I've opened my page here, which shows uh, the, the, the damage caused by the nematodes I've chosen on the wheat crop and whether the wheat crop is supporting the nematodes uh, um, buildup. So um, stubby root nematode is promoted by wheat as well as uh, tr Trichodorus primitivus. That's also supported, although wheat is not a host for those nematodes, but it supports nem uh, nematodes build up. It, it, so although wheat is not damaged, there's no crop damage that's that's seen uh, or reported in literature, but it will have in, an impact on your potato crop. And I think I shall end there if that's okay. No, that's perfect. That's perfect. Thank you, that Grace. And uh, yeah, sorry for the the technical issues um but yeah no that was a that was a thorough breakdown of the database and i think anyone who's interested in more detail uh you know make sure to take a look at the publications on the hdb website and the ones grace posted on slide three um as well as visiting and just having a play around yourself on the best for source website yes. um so again we'll we'll, we'll just we've, there's a couple of questions come through so we'll we'll just have a quick q a with with you grace um, one thing I'd like to ask you, um, and if you're not prepared, prepared, just say, but Grace, um, so let's say a farmer is in charge of his whole rotation and he has a problem with free limbing nematodes um, and tobacco ratavirus, um, as many people do. Do you have a sort of scenario and plan to minimise the, the, the spraying in the, in the rotation? Well, this is what the nematologists are trying to build um, as well as supporting information. So unfortunately, because the database, when I demonstrated it, it's opening separate windows, which it will do on your own computers when you play around. You can't actually see that. But on for each color scheme and the dotted thing, if you go on the matrix and you click on it, behind it, you should have supporting information. And for some pages, the supporting information is there because this is still being built. Um, but for other pages, it's, it is not there. So I think people will have to play around. And because I'm not a nematologist myself, um, I, I can't really answer these questions. But the nematologists that have done this each, uh, background literature search are trying to do that behind the screens and uh, supplying this wiki page with more information to help farmers and growers. Perfect. And then we'll, we'll have one more and Roy might be able to uh, go into more detail at the end on this. But um, on best for soils, it looks as if some nematodes are hosted by a wide range of crops. Is a bare fallow the only escape? Mm. <laughs> Maybe Roy will be able to help. OK, you're right, yeah, that, Alex. That, that's perfect. That's perfect. Um, We'll have one more. We'll have one more. 
Um, just pick a good one, hopefully. Uh, when a company claims an oil radish variety resists certain nematodes or club root, how can the potential customer c confirm if this is true? Well, that's actually the resist where um, where the dots and the, when you go on the web uh, on the website and you do play around with the database, you will see that for some for some of the dots and and colors, the matrices, there is a V or varietal uh, thing that shows you that there is variety resistance within whatever commercial uh, varieties that are sold. So we have to, I think, as farmers and growers. Um, if, if there is a resistant variety and it's available, commercially available, and you know your land is infested uh, by your uh, nematode of interest, uh, then maybe you could grow this variety, but also you can check with them, I think, directly. I think that's the only thing, because some of these resistances, as I don't know how nematodes work, but Roy might be able to answer this, but we know for, for, for fungi, for example, sometimes uh, resistances are broken so maybe a variety can be resistant for a while and then later on it's not but there are varieties out there that claim resistance and you can check with your seed supplier that it is true resistance because then you can test your soil and if your potato crop is impacted you can go back to them and say well i knew i had a problem i chose this variety because you stated and you know <laughs> i don't know whether legally you could chase anything but you know it's good evidence if, if they're saying they've got it that they should be selling what uh, they've got on the tin. Yeah, for sure. Have a look at the data that backs it up. Get in touch with the with the breeders. Um, so that's yeah, that's the questions done for now. I think just for for time, there is a few more at the end. But we'll we'll thank you for that, Grace, and and we'll we'll pass over to Craig now, who uh, as mentioned is a member of the Namaste Stewardship Program, and he will be discussing all involved with that. Okay. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Craig Chisholm. I am the field technical manager for potatoes and vegetables at Corteva AgriScience, but I'm representing today the Nematicide Stewardship Program, uh, which we are just one of the stakeholders in. Um, as you can see from the slide, um, it, uh, and I'll ask to move on to the next one, please. Uh, it was set up in 2014. Um, its objective was to uh, manage granular nematicides per se, rather than any individual uh, brands, uh, to ensure safe usage uh, and to maintain their availability for uh, growers and a number of key sectors in, the, in UK agriculture going forward. So if we can move on, please. Uh, just to give you an indication of uh, the organisations that are part of the of the nematicide stewardship uh, program, you can see that HDB, uh, unsurprisingly, is one. But uh, you also pick up uh, Red Tractor and Basis, uh, the NFU, uh, the Potato Packers and Processors, uh, as well as uh, Distribution. Uh, and obviously the manufacturers as well. So a broad range of those with a, a stake in, uh, in those key market sectors. Uh, so if we can move on. Uh, the NSP has a number of partnerships, which I hope a good number of you will be aware of. Uh, as far as the uh, training of operators uh, and for people running businesses is concerned, that's run through Artis, uh, which is the training arm of NIAB. Uh, and I hope a number of you are familiar with that. You'll have a poll on that just in a, just in a moment. That delivers the sort of technical information and the skills that are required by operators in order to use nematicides safely, not just for themselves, but for the environment. Uh, and they uh, as well as delivering a number of uh, workshops historically, um, uh, deliver the e-learning, which uh, I'm sure a number of those listening have already taken part of. So if you just press the, the on, it just highlights the fact that uh, part of that e-learning going forward 
are the additional environmental aspects which have been added to the guidelines in recent years and you will have been aware of most of those uh, coming on stream last year uh, in 2020 um, as part of Red Tractor. Move on please. So uh, I've already mentioned uh, the workshops uh, which were run uh, up till 2019. Uh, the reason they sort of stopped going is that we uh, didn't have very many takers left anymore. I think we covered most people that needed to attend them. As you can see there, there have been over 1,300 uh, participants uh, all over the country in those. And if you move on, please. So this is your uh, opportunity, and I hope that uh, we're going to see a fairly positive response, we'll see. Uh, but have you visited the artist's website? And for those who need to, have you completed the online training module? Uh, now, if you haven't, um, obviously this time of year is an ideal opportunity to go on there uh, and uh, to have completed the module will be a requirement uh, under Red Tractor. So it doesn't have to be done every year, but it has to have been completed. So a reasonably even split there, uh, which indicates that uh, certainly for operators, uh, it would be, you know, time well spent uh, in the next month or two to visit the artist's website and you will find a link on the very last slide of this presentation which will take you there. So hopefully it makes it relatively easy. Next slide, please. So the partnerships that we have, um, just wanted to uh, clarify those. We work with uh, Pinstone Communications for PR. So you will uh, be aware of that not necessarily them specifically, but the NSP through industry, uh, agricultural press, media, and obviously on social media. Um, but one of the key things uh, I would encourage you to visit is the NSP website, which has been revamped with useful videos and instruction, um, good sort of infographics. Uh, and links for training as well. So hopefully that, uh, you know, I would certainly encourage you to go and visit that. Um, oh, we've moved on. Uh, sorry, uh, and uh, obviously, yeah, I think uh, the signposting and training was the key thing I wanted to draw there. So you, it was fine to move on. Okay. Uh, and the sort of activities of the NSP, I would just fill in the uh, all the points here for me, if you would. Just keep pressing the on button until it gets to the bottom. That's fine. Um, but you can see there, it's obviously we've talked about delivering workshops. We've talked about the online learning, um, but it that we do need to keep reinforcing the need uh, to incorporate uh, the uh, the aspects around safe use of granules and that's why it's been picked up and it's not just potatoes which we're talking about today but bear in mind that it is also uh, sugar beet uh, and carrots and parsnips which I've already had uh, a mention this morning uh, which included obviously obviously the focus there is on uh, free living nematode and as you will know it's now a part of the auditable uh, side of red tractor so when you have your red tractor audit if you're using granular nematicides there will be they will be looking for proof of the training and the uh, additional wildlife monitoring which has been added uh, in the last year if you can move on please uh, so the NSP protocol itself, um, obviously it was a set of guidelines to begin with, as I've already indicated, it's part of Red Tractor, so we don't need to spend uh, any more time on this slide. I think I covered that in the last one. Uh, but the key requirements uh, under the protocol are that uh, advice uh, needs to come from a basis qualified advisor uh, before you are uh, 
before you are able to employ uh, granular matricides in your crop. Uh, the operators will have to be able to show that they have the required certification. Now that will be PA4G and the additional training module. Uh, the machine should be calibrated at least uh, once in the previous in the last two years by uh, an NSTS uh, uh, qualified engineer. Uh, and you will have a, a record of that and also the uh, calibration which has been conducted at the beginning of the of the season and then at intervals throughout uh, and clearly you would have the appropriate PPE to hand uh, when handling granular nematocytes. Okay, move on. And the one thing which uh, was sort of introduced as a, a new uh, aspect around that in 2020 was the requirement to do uh, a wildlife uh, survey after the application of your granular nematicide. So that's in the 24 to 48 hours following application and planting. Uh, now, as part of that, you needed to show that the granules were fully incorporated and that there were no granules on the surface. In order to do that, uh, it was a requirement previously to have a, a means of shutting off the granular flow before the end of the row when the machine is lifted so we don't get any uh, being spread on the headlands uh, and it's all fully incorporated so it's applied and incorporated in a single pass um, and uh, filling should take place at a designated point in the field which ensures that a people are wearing the appropriate PPE and if they did have any spillage, they would have uh, a spade to deal with any small uh, uh, granular spill on the soil. They can bury that immediately, again, so that it is fully covered. Um, or if, and I've not heard of many instances where this is a case, but if they did have a, a larger spill, there are, uh, what they would do is uh, put it into an empty container wearing the appropriate PPE from their distributor uh, and that would be returned to the manufacturer. So, uh, and as I said, the last thing is this post application monitoring of wildlife, which is now a requirement. Uh, and there is uh, additional guidance on how that should be done uh, and uh, forms for recording it now available through Red Tractor. And I think that's on the next slide, he said. No, I think we've covered that. Uh, enough so red tractor assurance came in and as you can say you can find it under the the standards for fresh produce which covers potatoes carrots and parsnips and and, and as you'll be aware if you grow sugar beet it's on the combinable crops and sugar beet protocol okay so um yeah, this has pretty much been covered in what I've said. Um, so it's a requirement now. And as I say, the number of certificates that's been introduced that have uh, been uh, generated so far is just shy of 300. So I hope that uh, after this meeting, those of you who haven't already uh, gone on to the online training will, uh, will boost that number somewhat. Okay, next slide, please. So we've covered the online learning certificate. But the, it is an absolute requirement now under Red Tractor, which covers the majority of, uh, you know, the potato crops going into both fresh produce and uh, the processing side, as well as the sugar beet, and carrots and onions. Next slide, please. So there you can see it quite clearly on the right hand side of the screen. This is just a screenshot from uh, the Red Tractor standards. Um, and you can see that on the right, highlighted in yellow there, uh, is the uh, requirement to be able to prove in your record keeping uh, for the audit process. And it just lays it out nice and clearly. Okay. And I just want to highlight, although this has been introduced, there haven't been any wildlife incidents uh, recorded in the quarterly reports uh, to, and there is what it states you'll find on the label 
of uh, both Vidate and Nemethor in that if you were to find uh, have a wildlife issue that you would ring um, uh, oh sorry all of a sudden it's gone from gone from my you'd ring the manufacturer and um, Natural England um, uh, but we haven't had an incidence uh, in the time that records have been kept between 2015 sort of 15 and 19 and I'm certainly not aware of any incidents being reported in the 20 years that I've been uh, working with uh, granular nematicides so uh, generally as an industry we've been doing a great job the issue really here is to prove that we're doing a great job next slide so this is my last slide uh, I just want to uh, highlight the links to the websites, the NSP website, where you will find uh, it's very readable. There's all the information you will require and the links. Uh, the artist training there for those needing to do the online training module. Uh, and there's also a link there to Red Tractor, which is where you would go if you wanted the forms uh, for the audit trail. So I hope that gives you everything that you need. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for that, Craig. Um, very useful. Um, I think it's fair to say that, that the nematicides can be safe, uh, you know, when used in the correct, correct way and under the correct guidance. Um, so I think now, um, if if Johnny, you could pull up the presenters, and we will go to the Q and A session, um, and we will start with Craig um, because there's been quite a few, few come in. Um, and, and the first one being, um, is there any update on Viadate 10G re-registration? -re oh, uh, this is a surprise to have this question. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, I've got, uh, I'll give a little bit of information here. Um, as you, as a number of people uh, will be aware that the authorization for Viadate uh, 10G uh, runs out on the 31st of December. Um, there had been a request for additional information. Uh, Corteva, along with a range of stakeholders within the industry, supplied that data to DEFRA. Um, and uh, that, sorry, well, basically that information was supplied. Uh, and we're currently still awaiting a response from DEFRA uh, having supplied that. So that's that's where we are today. Um, it's been part of a, an annual reauthorization for a number of years now, and we have been here before. So that information was supplied in August. And as I say, we are currently still awaiting that decision. I can assure you that it's been made very clear to DEFRA that a number of key uh, market sectors need clarity on this and that is required urgently uh, but I can't say that we have had our response as yet um, however just to provide some reassurance uh, we are currently in a position uh, where we will be able still have the flexibility to meet UK demand if and when reauthorization is granted so I hope that gives you something but I, what I can't do is I can't say that we've had that answer just yet. No, that's that's good. Thanks for that, Craig. And then sort of linked in with this, that on the, the NSP side, um, stewardship was working well for metaldehyde, then it was suddenly lost. How can the NSP try to ensure this does not happen to nematicides? That's a great question. Um, and it's not one which I can answer easily except to say that an enorm a huge amount of effort and dialogue has gone in. There's been a lot done to try and pull in all the stakeholders uh, and ensure that uh, we sort of move things on. And part of the wildlife surveys which have come in in 2020 and now bolstered in 21 with, uh, you know, the forms and the the audit process uh, so that we can prove what a good job we're doing and how professional people are in the ways they use granular nematicides will help. Is it a guarantee? I'm afraid it isn't. 
um, but it's the best that we can offer and it's about engaging uh, and having dialogue and that's that's as much as we can do yeah i'll uh, i'll mix it up a bit now and go to roy now now bear with the pronunciation but verticillium species down regulate host plant resistance to blackleg v darley and v albo atrum have been isolated from pbtc seed tuber material what do you know about the relationship between these pathogens and free living nematodes okay <clears throat> so the verticillium dali is the one i refer to in, in, in my presentation and it's well characterized as being part of the disease complex of potato early dying disease especially in north america and there's been considerable work done with um pratoenchus and verticillium dali um that is not that is not the same for uh albu alba atrum verticillium alba atrum to my knowledge um i'm not aware of similar work um that's characterized um that fungus with any relationship to um, free living nematodes or any plant parasitic nematodes now i may be incorrect in that statement but to my knowledge um i'm not aware of any work done to to link the nematodes with that particular fungal species a lot of work done um with dalii and especially pratoenchus as i say in north america Okay, and then um, should seed inspectors have to take samples of FLN from prospective seed fields as they do with PCN, then fields at high risk of blackleg could be kept out of the supply chain? Well, as someone who's uh, made a career out of free living nematodes, yeah, I suppose the answer, right, take, it, take away the, flip, the good answer, yes, is the answer. I, I would, I think that's, I think that's, uh, uh, would be a sensible uh, approach because monitoring is one of the uh, interventions and strategies that would certainly help farmers um, plan the rotation, understand which crops go in which field at a particular time in the rotation. Um, so yes, I think I think it would be um, appropriate, um, but obviously there's a cost implication, so there has to be a pragmatic um, solution to that um, because it can't can't keep piling uh, economic uh, costs onto the onto the farm. Yeah. No, I think that's right. That's, that's good. Um, one one for Grace now. How should we manage FLN on rented land if we only have it for one season? Is <laughs> is pesticide the only way? Um, and yeah, I think I'll target this one at Grace as it's a good chance to use the rotational planning aid from uh, Besser Soils. Uh, so maybe I'll give you. a Top top takeaway points or something like that. <laughs> yes, I, I I think it's really that's a big challenge. You know, if you've got only the land for one year, there's not much you can do. So you probably need some synthetic <laughs> management type thing. So yeah, chemistry maybe. Um, I I don't know if there are any quick fixes or whether you could work with the landowner to put in a cover crop perhaps that could get rid of that or at least bring populations down uh, of the nematodes. So you could work uh, with the landowner if you're renting it. Okay, and then and then linked to that, is there a list of cover crop varieties with specific uh, resistances? Probably, I think from the um, from the breeders and the seed houses, uh, I'm sure they would have done such such work. So they, they could be, I know sometimes for, for horticulture, and this is horticultural crops, sometimes you don't get the full, full picture from just your seed label. Um, so I think um, potatoes are a big crop and I would imagine if they wanted the variety to sell, they would have it on label that this variety is resistant to this uh, nematode. But if not, I think you should always just check. Um, one for Craig. Um... What problems do operators say they have in complying with the guidelines? Um, I have to say, I have had no, uh, ne you know, issues sort of come back to me to say that they have had any difficulties. I mean, I've been greatly encouraged by the fact that people seem to have been able to uh, adopt the guidelines 
uh, very well into their systems without it causing them a major issue. And it's, a, it's been about just ensuring that we plan in advance. We always get, uh, you, know, you know, engineers, I'm sure, always get pushed very hard close to planting when they haven't been able to get access to kit to calibrate it. But yeah. generally, as an industry, it's something we're used to doing now, and we're very, we're very efficient at. Uh, and generally, people uh, people have done a great job, um, and I think it's testament to the professionalism out there. No, perfect. And then, well, there's there's two questions here, but I'll I'll, I'll link them in together. Um, has Red Tractor started checking on compliance with NSP rules and are they seeing any non-compliance? And then following on from that, how do you feel the NSP could go further to ensure those growing non-farm assured potatoes also comply with the NS NSP rules? Uh, right. The first one of that is it has been part of the audit process since last year, so since 2020. Um, and therefore, um, it is something that inspectors will have been looking for. Uh, what they may have not have found, which is newer for this year, is the fact that we've now provide. There is now a set of forms to help and and guidance for people about how you do the aspects of that, particularly the wildlife survey. Um, so that that's now uh, clearer for people and should make it easier to uh, to adopt because they're not left to your own devices to the same degree. Um, sorry, can you remind me the second part of the question? How do you feel the NSP could go further to ensure to those further. growing non-farmed assured potatoes uh, right. also comply with the program? Okay, the, the interesting thing is uh, the, there are the vast majority of speciality crops which I, in which I include potatoes but you know the carrots, onions, sugar beets, parsnips, etc., are in the in the red tractor assurance scheme. Um, on, you know, as near as damn it, 100% in most instances. Um, uh, and then uh, there are some outside uh, that in potatoes, uh, and that doesn't mean to say that the guidance, the NSP guidance, uh, is not part of the sort of targeted at them as well. So while they are not necessarily within the red tractor fence, shall we say, um, they're certainly still receiving the information and being strongly encouraged to make sure that they adopt it. Good stuff. Um, one for Roy now. Um, and again, excuse the pronunciation, Melodogine confirmed cases for M. phalax and N. Hapla in England, with the species present in some major EU seed potato producing areas, these pests will already have been transmitted. Should we be worried and what action is recommended? Okay, not, not, a, um, not, a, not a question. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, Moedogyne. Okay, so there are indigenous species of Moedogyne in the UK. Um, so, for example, if you were to go and have a wander around your beach um, associated with marram grass, there are indigenous species of Moedogyne. Um, but that's not what I'm sure the, the, the person who asked the question was interested in. Um, recently in Northern Ireland, uh, there's been a peer-reviewed scientific publication um, where there was a survey of, I can't remember exactly how many fields or farms, maybe 200, maybe slightly less, which found that 6% or thereabouts of the agricultural fields had Moidegyne minor. Um, that's a, a species that previously was an amenity, viewed as a pest of amenity turf, um, but it's actually from work in the Netherlands been shown as a potato pest and pathogen. So there's a clear issue there that been reported in Northern Ireland. Um, I'm aware of that both in the farming press and also in some of the online bulletins from Thera uh, over the recent years, there's been mention of Moidegyne species, those that you mentioned in the question, Alex, um, that have been highlighted uh, in the UK. Now, where the source of that, those species, that's difficult to ascertain. I mean, I, I'm also aware that CABI 
I've also uh, listed a couple of the Malaydigani species with a note, note of a restricted distribution in the UK. Again, where those species were sourced from is another matter. Um, the point about trade, there's trade in and out of the UK. Um, if there's any soil adhering to any tubers, um, either way, there's a potential to import or export nematodes. That's well known. So there is potential. Um, I can't comment whether it's actually happened, but certainly what we should be doing is certainly testing. Um, and that's, and we have, uh, there are clear um, protocols in place, whether it be Thera or SASA, um, for testing of materials. And um, that should continue. Um, we shouldn't let our guard down for whether it be Moidegaini or any other species that may be uh, in, in other countries that um, in the future may or may not be an issue. So monitoring surveillance is a key uh, is a key um, tool in the armory um, for the protection of industry. Okay, thank you. And then one just to round up, uh, not sure who has to take it, but when and how do we best do soil tests for FLN? Is it one sample per field and how much does it cost? Roy might take that one. Okay, uh, best time to do it? No, yeah. absolutely no. Um, okay, maybe not today because here it's still frosty and, and, and the soil is frozen hard. But um, effectively, um, early October, depending upon the farming year and depending upon the individual and, and location in the UK, maybe mid-September through to uh, April. But as I say, it depends on the location. Um, one sample per field, uh -uh, no way. Um, anyone who's heard me talk before know I, knows I have a, a slide with um, a roulette wheel and a single sample in the field, you're playing roulette. Um, nematodes, it's well known that nematodes have a very heterogeneous distribution in, fi in fields. So by taking a single sample at a particular location, you could be in a trough, a dip, a low number, and the rest of the field or adjacent areas, etc., high numbers. The recommendation, and I appreciate that economically, this is maybe again going back to on-farm costs, not pragmatic, is a sample per hectare. And I appreciate that that is a cost implication. Um, but that has to be balanced up against the potential loss of yield. But there are pragmatic ways to, to um, uh, sample um, if that's, that cost-benefit analysis doesn't favour um, one per hectare. In terms of cost, well, there are a number of um, organisations that offer services and there's a range of costs. I'm going to fudge that one because obviously we all have different costs. We do have different cost pricing models and it really does depend on what the ask is and also how many samples are being um, provided. So, drop me an email. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's good. It's, time's getting on a bit now. So, um, I think uh, that covers most of the questions. Um, any any questions that aren't answered, um, we'll get back to you in the coming days. Um, and and I guess in summary, nematodes are not all the same, and they have 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 different means of controls. Um, and there is so much that agronomists uh, can do to ensure fields are tested and, um, you know, appro appropriate action taken in terms of rotation and treatment and things like that. So, you know, there's still more work to be done, um, but, but it's an in interesting time. Um, so I just want to say a big thank you to all of our speakers, Roy Nielsen from uh, the James Hutton Institute, Grace Choto from HDB and Craig Chisholm from the uh, Nematicide Stewardship Programme. And uh, thank you for putting in the time and effort uh, to present today. So thank you. I'd also like to highlight the documents attached below. Um, if you scroll down, you can see them at the bottom. And there's, there's some good, useful information on, on plant parasitic nematodes in general, as well as, uh, you know, specific uh, documents on PCN. Um, so if you wish, you could uh, all have a read of them if you, if you want to learn, learn a little bit more. Um, below, there's also the feedback forms. Um, so if you could all remember to fill in um, the feedback forms, you know, it really helps us deliver better content to you guys, um, you know, and 
and you can find that if you as mentioned if you if you scroll down uh, under surveys and it's the the session feedback and then finally the um the basis the basis points and then roso points slide has has been pulled up um this this shows you unique codes so for for basis it's b for 2c and then for n roso it's n for 2c so if you make a note of them and then you know if you watch a few more you can pile i think eight and then um you can log that on the left hand column um, of the platform so uh that's that's all really I, I, you know i hope you've enjoyed this session and our next session is an exhibitor session over lunch at one till two and then following on from that is is uh two till three thirty we have aphid and virus control um which which is obviously a particularly important one in the industry at the moment and uh yeah if you want if you have any more questions or you want to contact me or any of the speakers feel free to search your name on the platform and you can find the further contact details there um so so with those bits rounded off that leaves me to say thank you once again for for joining the session today i hope you enjoyed it and uh, you enjoy the rest of the week thank you and goodbye